Good morning, church family. Good morning. What a change. People are moving around in the building. Well done. It's great to see you at different spots and different uh, places. I don't have the, the usual faces where, where I look, especially that upper section there. It's good to be together. It's great to see your freedom, that you are free to, to break tradition and you are free to move around a little bit. May God increase your freedom in following him and uh, moving outside of the box whenever he is guiding and leading us. That was my short sermon as we, um, as we are starting. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for the Christmas choir. We are forming a Christmas choir from both churches to help with the Christmas services. If you wish to take part in it, would you please um, sign your name, if you know what part you are singing, and if you have an email address um, or a phone number, would you please sign up to be part of the choir? Or that Lindsay knew next time she will be here. The first practice will be on Wednesday, the 23rd of November, from 7.45 to 8.45 here in Caridor, and then on the following Wednesday in Bolly Black. There will be four practices. The first one is on Wednesday, the 23rd of November. The PW is on this Wednesday night, the 9th of November from half seven. The speaker is George Barkley and his theme is farming. So if anyone is interested in farming, we'll be most welcome to, to join the PW this Wednesday from half seven. And also, if you haven't got your communion token filled out, uh, go to Herbie after the service. Um, he will be able to help you, or you will find some tokens um, at the corner of the desk here in the foyer. Our call to worship. We have come from a world full of questions, some simple, some hard, some seemingly trivial, some immense, some quick to answer, some seemingly impossible. As we come to worship, do not leave your questions at the door, but bring them all, great and small, for God is here with us today. Let's talk to him. Let us pray. God of life and death, we bring to you our hearts and minds, our questions and our fears, the things we understand and our uncertainty, those we love and those who are in trouble, knowing that with you all are safe, as we are safe in life and in death. Heavenly Father, you invite us to have a relationship with you. Because of the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, we are able to know you intimately. We praise you for your presence. Through your Spirit, you are with us wherever we go. You take pleasure in our prayers and our praises. May the souls which thirst for your promises, be filled from your abundance through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us stand as we sing our opening praise as the dear pen.
Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are the God of the living and that we are made alive in you. We thank you that you are a God who longs to listen to your people. Help us not be ashamed to come to you with not just our words of love and praise, but also with our doubts and fears, knowing that your love for us will never change. Give us the confidence to ask life's hard questions and give us the faith to keep following you no matter what the answers are. Lord, we bring our questions to you. Give us the courage to be part of the answer. Lord, when there's so much suffering in the world, it's hard to know which questions and petitions to bring to you first. We bring to you the continent of Africa, so much of which is now on the brink of starvation. We cry out to you to bring relief to the people who have lost so much due to the climate change. We pray that the richer nations will see the news reports and be quick to respond. We continue to remember those suffering from the flooding in Pakistan, cyclones in Central America and the worn, torn lands of the earth, including Yemen, Syria and Ukraine. We remember those who have died in the crush in South Korea and the bridge collapse in India. When we see so much suffering, we can't help but ask, why? Teach us, help us, enable us to be answers to the questions, doing all we can to uplift and support those in direst need. Give our government the courage to increase its overseas aid budget, even when there is great need at home. Lord, we bring our questions to you. Give us the courage to be part of the answer. Heavenly Father, we pray for our nation. With all the turmoil of the last few weeks, please help our governments to have a time of stability so that the needs of the people can be addressed. We pray for all those struggling with the cost of living. We pray that those of us who have wealth may be quick to share it, so that our food banks and warm places are resourced with everything they need. We pray for our health service under extreme pressure. We pray for workers who are conflicted about whether or not to take strike actions. We pray for the migrants risking their lives in small boats and being housed in cramped conditions when they arrive. Lord, we don't have the answers to all those needs. We often feel so helpless. Give your church the strength to rise up and respond your way. Lord, we bring our questions to you. Give us the courage to be part of the answer. Lord, we pray for all children, young people and students that their schools, colleges and universities may be places where questioning is welcomed and they are encouraged to be curious about the world in which they are growing up. We pray that they will find wisdom as well as knowledge. We pray for those working in fields of science, development and technology, that the questions they ask will bring new treatments for diseases, new ways of living well without spoiling the earth resources, new ways of working in harmony, with the beautiful world you have created. We bring to you, Lord, our questions about those we love who are ill or who have recently died. 
We know that you, Jesus, wept when Lazarus, your friend, died. But then you brought him back to life. And we know that you healed many people, but we also know that you do not always heal in this life. Lord, we admit to finding this hard to understand and at times hard to cope with. We, we bring to you in the stillness all those on our hearts who are struggling right now. Be close to them, Lord. Let them know your comfort and bring relief to those in pain, we ask. Father, go before us into the week ahead. Enable us to ask the right questions and to listen carefully for the answers. Then lead us on to be your hands and feet and eyes and ears to everyone we work or live with. And fill us with your strength and comfort and faithfulness to follow wherever you lead. Lead us forward. Lead us onward. Lead us closer to you. We ask all these questions and prayers in the knowledge that we are heard and loved because of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our next praise. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> It's easy for us because we have moved so many times during our life. Uh, we don't have too much clutter in our garage, but do you have a garage, a corner of a garage or a shed that you have some stuff, some clutter? Maybe it's a bit rusty. Is that the word? Yeah, or uh, yeah rusty and there are parts missing or knobs or handles and they are waiting uh, for you to find the right parts um yeah anyone yeah or, or maybe you are waiting for for um talking to someone who can give you advice how to fix that thing yeah what is going to happen with those stuff <laughs> A portion of them might be fixed sometime, but uh, eventually 
broken stuff end up in the recycling center, right? Because that's where they end up when we cannot fix them, when we don't have the time, the energy. That's usually what happens to broken things. We purge them from our lives. They are no longer of any use to us. This series is about seeing our lives as bread that Jesus takes in his hand, blesses, breaks, and gives for the life of the world. Last week, we talked about how difficult it is to imagine our ordinary common lives actually being blessed and sacred and holy. Yet that is what happens to our story when we surrender to Jesus. To be blessed is to have our identity recovered and restored. It is to become who we were made to be, carriers of God's glory. This week, I want to talk to you about the word broken. We use the word broken in several ways. First, and you will see on the next slide, brokenness is a way to describe our own frailty. This is the experience of running up against our own limitations and finiteness. This is not the kind of brokenness we are going to talk about today. Secondly, brokenness can also be a way to refer to our own failure. When we come up short, when we miss the target, the mark, when we fail what is required of us in a given situation or in a given relationship, we come face to face with our brokenness. And finally, brokenness is also a way of speaking about the fallen world. When sickness or death occurs, when tragedies happen, we hear the creation groan, the creaking and cracking of the world, things coming apart from the seams. All these are signs of the brokenness of the world. Next slide, please. It's these last two kind of brokenness, the brokenness of our failure and the fallen world that I want us to look at today. What can Jesus do with our brokenness? Like bread that is broken, do we begin to lose our freshness do we become stale and useless? Or does Jesus receive our brokenness into his hands? Let's read from the second blessed, broken, given story from Luke's Gospel. When Jesus takes bread into his hands, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it. This time I'm only reading one verse. Luke chapter 22, verse 19. Jesus, after taking the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Soon we will hear these words again during communion. When Jesus said these words, he was with his disciples celebrating Passover, commemorating God's rescue of Israel from Egypt and God's judgment of sin and evil. At the Bible study on Thursday, we learned from George about the Passover lamb. God delivered his people by providing a covering of blood over their sins. That makes this passage the perfect place to talk about what Jesus does with our brokenness. And first, let's talk about the brokenness of our failure. Unlike the gods and priests of other religions in the ancient world, 
Israel's God provided a sacrifice specifically for the removal of guilt. The most dramatic way sin was dealt with in Israel's worship came on the day of the year known as the Day of Atonement. On that day, the high priest would first offer sacrifice to cleanse himself. But then, as we see on the next slide, then he would select two goats. After laying hands on one goat and imparting to it all the sins of the nation, the priest would lead that goat out into the wilderness. Do you catch the meaning of the act? The goat took the blame and the shame away from the nation and was led away, visualizing how God removes guilt from his people. The second goat was sacrificed and its blood was sprinkled on the altar inside of the Holy of Holies. This goat took the punishment. A picture of God allowing the people to be spared judgment. These symbolic acts were found only in the Israelite religion. Their God was the only God who made a way to deal with sin, guilt and shame. In the brokenness of our own sin, we can find a blessing that removes guilt. All the stuff about goats and priests and temples and sacrifices were to point forward to Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. This is how Hebrews describe it in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. If the blood of goats sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. There was, there was an old blessing a prayer the high priest in Israel would say over the people of God. And we read it in, in Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Because of Jesus our guilt and shame is removed from us. And because of Jesus, every word of that blessing is now true for all who belong to him. This is no longer a petition like in the time of Israel. It's no longer a request or, or wishful thinking that may the Lord bless you. But a proclamation. Hear it over yourself today as you are sitting here in the pew. The Lord blesses you and keeps you. The Lord is smiling at you. The Lord is turned toward you and he gives you peace. Jesus takes the brokenness of our sin and gives us Peace. Next slide, please. Other times, suffering is not the result of guilt, but result of the brokenness of the world. Let's talk about the second kind of brokenness, the brokenness of the fallen world. Last year, we looked into Jesus resurrecting Lazarus. After their brother Lazarus' death, the questions that both Martha and Mary asked of Jesus is the very question that haunts us in our suffering. 
Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Is the question that arises every time we face the reality. We live in a broken world full of pain and difficulties and suffering. The question is, couldn't you have prevented this, God? Couldn't you have prevented? If you had been here, couldn't you have prevented this, God? When a person suffers needlessly, when pain seems random or worse, unjust, the, the appeal to the God of mercy and justice rings throughout Scripture. How long, O oh Lord, why do the righteous suffer? Or in the case of Lazarus, why did you not do something, Jesus, to prevent this? Lazarus was not an enemy of God, neither a wicked person. This must have caused Mary and Martha to wonder, is there no justice in the world? Is there no compassion in God? You see, what we op often hope for from God is prevention. In the face of the brokenness of the world, we want to be spared. We do not want to be bent or bruised by the brokenness of the groaning world. When Jesus taught us to pray that we might be spared the great day of trouble, trial and testing, yet for reasons beyond our grasp, God chooses not to major in prevention. Yet God opts for something he must know is stronger than prevention, something we call redemption. And redemption is stronger than prevention. Hear me out because this is the main point. Redemption is stronger than prevention. You see it in the story of Lazarus. We, we often re refer to this story when Jesus resurrected Lazarus. But this is not quite right. Lazarus was only raised only to die again. So this is more accurately described as resuscitation rather than resurrection. He was not raised in the same way that Jesus would be raised. With a perfect and glorified body that is incorruptible. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure Lazarus was thrilled to experience it. But resurrection is what awaits all who are in Christ. The resuscitation that Lazarus experienced was a sign of the resurrection to come. It is a clue suggesting what God will do about the brokenness of the world. Resurrection doesn't tiptoe around death. It breaks death's power completely. Resurrection is the reversal and undoing of death. That's the power of redemption. Just as re resurrection is stronger than death, redemption is more powerful than prevention. If you are free to do that, just, just close your eyes for a moment and imagine an artist who works a public piece, like a mural on the wall or, or a building. Imagine her choosing to leave her work out in the open. No ropes, no cones, no guards. Restricting access. It is one kind of strength for an artist to prevent her work from being vandalized. But this is another power to say whatever you scribble on this piece. I will find a way to make it even more beautiful than it was before, isn't it? A whole different level of power. Now imagine a chess player, unafraid of his opponent's strategy. 
It's a certain kind of genius for a chess player to block the moves his opponent wishes to make. It's a whole different of order of play, brilliance altogether to say, whatever your move, I will still put you in checkmate. A whole different level of power. It is one kind of power to say, you shall not harm me. But, uh, but it is a wholly other kind of power to say, do your worst. I will prevail. On the cross, Jesus absorbed the full weight of evil and the judgment of God against it. Jesus became the sin that leads to death, and he became the curse that infects God's world. Jesus drained the venom from the serpent and drank the poison to the lost. He died the death that is at once sin's wage and God's verdict. And on the third day, the Father raised him up from the dead. Now, because of his resurrection, one day death will be swallowed up in victory. And only God can do this. Only God can take the brokenness and bring blessedness from it. Only God can make blessedness come through brokenness. Next slide, please. Jesus takes the brokenness of the world and gives us hope. Whether the brokenness is from our own frailty or failure or the fallenness of the world, we are still God's image bearers. We are, and this is still God's world, the world he created and he blessed. Next slide. The sin and suffering God did not prevent are not beyond his capability to redeem. The sin and suffering God did not prevent are not beyond his capability to redeem. What God blessed, he will redeem. He has the power to make his blessing come to pass over and against the infection of evil. God, the creator, blesses. God, the redeemer, carries the blessing to its completion, even through brokenness that comes. God's redemption makes even the broken become blessed. God did this by becoming the broken. In Jesus, the blessed God became the broken human, so that we broken humans might become God blessed. So, to be broken is to be opened up to the grace of God. When you place your brokenness in Jesus' hands, it becomes openness. It is brokenness that opens up to grace and grace that puts us together. The goal is to let the grace of God redeem and restore and repair us. Do you see um, the piece of art, the, the, the ball on the picture? There's an old Japanese art of mending broken pottery, kintsugi, and it means golden joiner. It's the art of joining broken pieces of pottery with a liquid resin that resembles gold. The result is a bowl or vase that is more beautiful, more aesthetically complex, and a lot more valuable than the original piece. The new piece with golden seams became so popular among Japanese art collectors in the 15th century 
that some were even accused of purposely breaking pottery in order to repair it with gold? This sounds like grace. Grace that takes the broken pieces and puts it back together in such a way that it is more beautiful and more valuable than it was before. So where is brokenness in your life? Is it because of your own failure? Or is it because of the broken world that we live in? Let your brokenness open you up to the grace of God. When grace comes rushing in, it does not leave us broken in our sin. Can we go back to the previous slide, please? Grace does not leave us broken in our sin. It heals, it restores, it cleanses and forgives. It makes us new in a way that is more beautiful than we could have imagined. Grace is the gold that holds the broken pieces together. Let him take your broken life today. Whether you are broken by your own failure or by the fallenness of this world, place your life in Jesus' hand. Let us stand as we prepare our hearts for the communion, singing, Here, O my Lord, I see you face to face.